Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session where the title of my presentation is Barn Raising from 19th Century Temperance Movement Women to 21st Century Wiki Movement Women. My, my name is Rosie Stevenson Goodnight. I am the co-founder of a group called Women in Red. And what we do is try to create more new articles related to women, women's biographies, women's works, and women's issues broadly construed. In this role, what I have done is written a lot of women's biographies, something close to 2,300 of them. And as it turns out, many of them were about temperance era women. And it came to pass that thinking about these temperance era women, I saw some parallels and some compare and contrast in my mind between those women and what they did, the hurdles they faced, the opportunities they had, the way they moved forward, and similarities with Wiki women of today. So here I am speaking to you on the topic. This is my second time, spoke about it at Wikimania in Katowice in August. The image you see here is of Mary Howard Willer, a temperance activist from Indianapolis. We have a lot to cover and my time has been shortened by just a little bit, but we'll, get, we'll stay on track. This is what the agenda shall be. Let's get started. Barn raising, why do I use that word? Barn raising historically was a raising bee or a rearing in the United Kingdom. It was a collective action. It involved a community and involved usually a barn for one of the members of the community. It was then built or rebuilt collectively by members of the community. Similarly with temperance, there was often one person in a community who started it, but together with the rest of the community, they built something, they made something of it. The temperance movement. Well, according to Wikipedia, the temperance movement is a social movement promoting temperance or complete abstinence from consumption of alcoholic beverages. Participants in the movement typically criticize alcohol intoxication or promote teetotalism and its leaders emphasize alcohol's negative effects on people's health, personality, and family lives. Typically, the movement promotes alcohol education and also demands the passage of new laws against the sale of alcohol, either regulations on the availability of alcohol or the complete prohibition of it. Now, back in the 19th and early 20th century, the temperance movement became prominent in many countries, particularly English speaking, but also Scandinavian and also majority Protestant ones. And it eventually led to national prohibitions in Canada, 1918 to 1920, in Norway, spirits only, from 1919 to 1926, in Finland, 1919 to 1932, in the United States, 1920 to 1933, as well as provincial prohibition in India, 1948 to present. The temperance movement in the United Kingdom was a social movement that also campaigned against the recreational use and sale of alcohol and promoted total abstinence. The early temperance movement was inspired by the actions of Irish Presbyterian Church Minister John Edgar, who poured his stock of whiskey out of his window in 1829 and wrote the Belfast Telegraph advocating temperance. Edgar and other early advocates concentrated their efforts on the elimination of spirits rather than wine and beer. The first organization that promoted temperance was founded a little later, 1829, by John Donlop and his aunt, Miss Lilas Graham of Gearbard, and named the Glasgow and West of Scotland Temperance Society. In the United States, the temperance movement was born with Benjamin Rush's 1784 track called an inquiry into the effects of ardent spirits upon the human body and mind, 
which judged that excessive use of alcohol was injurious to physical and psychological health. Influenced by Russia's inquiry, about 200 farmers in uh, Connecticut formed a temperance association in 1789 to ban the making of whiskey. Smaller associations were formed in Virginia, in New York, and in the 19th and 20th century, the temperance movement had grown and become a large influence on American politics and American society, culminating with the prohibition of alcohol through the 18th Amendment to the United States. A myriad of factors contributed to women's interest in the temperance movement. One of the initial contributions was the frequency in which women were the victims of those who had an alcohol use disorder. Another contribution was related to the role the women in the home of 19th century was largely to preside over their spiritual and physical needs of their homes and families. Because of this, women believed it was their duty to protect their families from the danger of alcohol and convert their family members to the ideas of temperance. This newfound calling, if you will, to temperance, however, did not change the widely held viewpoint that women were only responsible for matters which pertain to their homes. Consequently, women had what Ruth Borden referred to as the maternal struggle, which women felt was the internal contradiction that came with their newly discovered power to make change while still believing in the nurturing and domestic roles without yet understanding how to use their newly acquired power. June Soshan called women who join movements such as women's temperance organizations, pragmatic feminists, because they took action to solve their grievances, but were not interested in altering traditional sex roles. Missionary organizations of many Protestant denominations gave women an avenue to work from. Several all-female missionary societies already existed, and it was easy for them to transform themselves into women's temperance organizations. The temperance movement is a social movement that pr promotes uh, temperance and complete abstinence. And during the 19th and 20th century, it became more and more prominent. What did the women do? Starting in 1873 in Ohio, we know of something called the Woman's Crusade. It was a temperance movement and a series of non-violent protests fighting against the dangers of alcohol. It originated in Cleveland and spread to over 900 different communities in more than 31 states in the US spreading to over 900 other communities in the course of the next few years. Main organizer of it, Women's Crusade, was Eliza Daniel Stewart. She's referred to fondly as Mother Stewart. She began her career in public service during the American Civil War, working with the Soldiers Aid Societies. She visited the United Kingdom in 1876 and there helped organize the British Women's Temperance Association. The Women's Christian Temperance Organization was organized in 1873 in Ohio. It was at one time the largest women's organization in the United States. The world's WCTO U was founded in 1893 and became the international arm of the organization with affiliates in Australia, Canada, Netherlands, Finland, India, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Korea, the UK, among others. After she was widowed and buried three of her four children, Annie Wittenmeyer, born in 1827, served as the first national president of the WCTU. She was, by the way, also the seventh national president of the Women's Relief Corps and also served as president of the nonpartisan national WCTU. Posthumously, she was inducted into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. Frances Willard, 
born a little later, 1839, served as the first dean of women at Northwestern University. For 19 years, she served as the second president of the WCTU. She was the founder of the world's WCTU, and she was the first president of the National Council of Women of the United States. The British Temperance Asso Women's Temperance Association, later renamed the White Ribbon Association, was formed in Newcastle upon Tyne in 1876. An important member was Lady H Henry Somerset, born in a little later, 1851. Isabella spoke at the first World's WCTU Convention in Boston in 1891 and was the president of the British Women's Temperance Association. The Swiss Federation of Abstinent Women was organized in Switzerland a little bit later, 1902, by the Zurich writer and activist Hedwig Bühler Wasser, together with the Dr. Marie Heim Vogtlin and the women's rights activist Clara Ragas Nadek. Azuma Morai, born in 1884, standing, was the head of the Loyal Temperance Legion Women Program in Japan, which served as the WCTU's outreach to children. She also served as secretary and traveling assistant to temperance activist Yajima Kaiko, born in 1833, seated, who was the founder of the Women's Reform Society of Japan and president of Japan's WCTU. Henny Takira Karuma, born in 1840 and anglicized as Jane Foley after her second husband's surname, was a New Zealand Maori. In later life, she worked in the New Zealand's WCTU and was that organization's honorary secretary for the Maori mission of Rotorua. You can see how the movement has spread, and now we're going to move from just activists to how these women became journalists and lecturers and editors. Lillian Stevens, born in 1843, helped launch the Maine State Chapter, Maine State Chapter of the WCTU. After Frances Willard died, Stevens was elected as the third president of the national WCTU. She also served as the editor-in-chief of the WCTU's national organ, the Union Signal. Alafia Johannes' daughter, pictured on the far right, was an Icelandic teacher whose ambition was to bring the women of Iceland to a position of equality with men. She traveled and lectured internationally on behalf of the Organization of Good Templars and the world's WCTU. She went on to become an author, magazine editor, and textbook translator. Emil Rathew was a Swedish journalist. She was a newspaper editor, as well as a temperance and women's rights activist who founded the Swedish branch of the WCTU. But what else did they do? There are a lot of convenings that these women put together without the benefit of the internet, without the benefit of planes to fly them from here to there. How did they do it? But they did it. They found a way. And not only did they find a way to do it, but they published each of the speeches that was done at these convenings. Thumbnail sketches of white ribbon women published in 1895 has some of these uh, speeches. The Women's Temperance Publishing Association was a non-commercial publisher of this and other temperance literature. It was established in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was a concept of Matilda Kars, an Irish-born leader of the temperance movement. It was designed as a joint stock company no man could own its stock. It could only be sold to WCTU women. Around the world, in many languages, 
temperance women publish pamphlets, journals, magazines, newspapers, essays, children's literature, convention reports, bibliographic compilations, almanacs, and more, all in the name of the temperance movement. Photos, handwritten records, conference proceedings. What else? How about medals? The Demoris Medal Contest was established in 1886. It was a series of public oratory competitions founded as a means of prohibition propaganda. The WCTU was not slow to recognize the value of this educational system and soon adapted an idea of medal contests in many lines of its work. There were recitation books embracing oratories on prohibition, total abstinence, scientific temperance, anti-narcotics, franchise, social purity, and even other topics. Medals were designed with mottos and emblems, and some you can see pictured here. Banners and flags were created by many women's temperance organizations. These were displayed at their events, such as World's Fairs, and while walking in parades. Design and creation of banners, flags, and medals was another way that women could serve in the temperance movement. Fountains, monuments, and statues. This one here is Women's Christian Temperance Union Monument in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. Known as the Temperance Temple, or the Women's Temple, or the Woman's Temple, this was at one time the headquarters of the National WCTU in Chicago. It was built in 1890 when the WCTU numbered 200,000 women, and an additional 200,000 children were the members of the WCTU's loyal temperance legions. This building was demolished in 1926. Predating the Temperance Temple, the Francis Willard House in Evanston, Illinois, was a longtime headquarters of the WCTU. Today, it's a historic house museum owned by the National WCTU. The Women's Christian Temperance Union Administration Building, also located in Evanston, Illinois, served as the publishing house and national headquarters of the WCTU in 1910 and was added to the U.S. National Register of Historic Places in 2002. Still other examples of how temperance women broadened their work, their scope, was by donating ambulances used in World War I service in France. I wanted to leave room now for your comments and questions, and we're doing okay, I think, on time but I'll start with this one. What can 21st century Wiki movement women learn from 19th century temperance movement women? And by the way, this photo is of Frances Ellen Watkins, a WCTU leader, poet, and abolitionist. Thank you very much. I don't know who has the mic. Okay, um, so that's the question I'm starting with is, what can 21st century Wiki women learn from 19th century temperance movement women? What do you think? Well, I think it's fascinating that in an age where the communication isn't as good as ours, that they had a global movement. And they seemed to communicate with one another. And I assume that was through letters, because what else was there? And so I think if there is a way we can really solidify the gender issues with other women and men, we don't need to leave men out anymore, I don't think, 
uh, that might be something we could learn of, of how to communicate better across, uh, uh, globally, globally. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> what else? Although I think you nailed it. Hi, I, I just wanted to mention um, something about Francis Willard. So if any of you have, in your travels to Indianapolis this week, um, have visited the Indiana State Capitol, um, in the rotunda is a memorial to her. Um, it's a full, um, it's a full like copper, um, uh, like bas relief or frieze or whatever it's called. Um, but it's in the rotunda and I think every birthday of hers, um, they actually still put a wreath there. Um, and, and they've done that for many, many years. Um, I used to be a tour guide at the Capitol Tour Office, and so that's one of the things that's in the rotunda, along like a memorial to Wendell Wilkie, who ran for president from, in 1940, who was from Indiana, and a bunch of other people. But she's still there, and that's, a, I think, another interesting monument to this movement. So we should build some statues. Come on. Thanks. You know, I'll make a, a note about that. I, I make this kind of joke, but it's really not a joke, that 50 years from now, somebody's great-granddaughter is going to be doing her PhD dissertation on, you know, the wiki women of the early, you know, wiki movement. And they won't be able to do that if we don't document what it is that we do. And so finding a way to assure that the different presentations we do beyond the slide decks that go in Wikimedia Commons, if we were to, you know, publish them on, um, maybe on Meta as part of this conference in subpages, you know, it's just something for us to consider so that we have that information, because today we do, but 50 years from now when our great-granddaughter wants to do that dissertation, what is she going to have as her source document? Ray. Hi. Well, you discussed um, a lot of different modes of communicating, you know, publications, medals, uh, ribbons, uh, convenings. Um, there's one I'm curious about is an informal or an ephemeral uh, communication. Um, was there anything in any of the materials about the role of the telegraph in communication between these, these peoples or unions? If there was, I'm unaware. Colleen. Well, one thing I would be interested in, I was, uh, it was interesting that the, um, the movement was global, and I'd be interested in, like, what it looked like in these different um, areas of the world. What, what did it look like in New Zealand? What did it look like in Japan? Was this a colonial, like a colonization thing? Or what did the people in these countries, um, did it come from their own interests and their own um, uh, concerns for their own communities? Um, and and how, how did the uh, um, people from these different areas of the world relate to each other? How did they influence each other? That would be interesting information um, uh, to me and to our group, I think, in terms of the work that we do across cultures and, um, and how it is that we don't necessarily impose our view 
of how things should work, even on Wikipedia, or what counts on Wikipedia. How do we, how do we, um, how do we um, stay open to what's important in another culture, and how do we allow ourselves to be influenced in that? I, I think how they did it would be interesting in terms of information for how we might do it now. There is some information about that. For example, New Zealand archives and Australian archives, I saw there's quite a bit of information. I'm not able to access it, but there is a lot of information. I think I've written most of the articles about the temperance era women are about American women because I have access to that information. But if others had more interest and wanted to do the research in their areas, they could find it. I think in some countries it was the influence of, as I said early in my presentation, of missionaries. So a missionary went to Japan and, you know, that's how the um, information about the movement maybe got to a country like Japan, maybe not. But there was another factor, and that's that these some of these women didn't just stick with temperance as being the issue that um, they supported. They were also interested in suffrage. Some of them had an overlap. Some of them left temperance to work on suffrage. Some then were, as time moved forward in the early 20th century, were interested in the peace movement. And so the overlap might be that you started thinking about you know, one movement and then you developed interest in another. You may have stuck with both or you may have switched the area where you gave your attention. And that might be a way that you had um, an opportunity to meet women in other countries. I will say, you know, of course, who had the opportunity to travel? It wasn't every woman who had that opportunity. It, the women who had husbands that were diplomats, you know, they were the ones who went to another country. They were in a consul or an embassy, and they met other women in other countries that way. But you, you know, you saw a list of convenings. Convenings weren't just in the U.S. They were international convenings. And by being able to, some women, could afford crossing oceans and traveling to these um, various convenings in, in other countries. And then they came away as seeds. They, could, they came with new ideas and could populate those new ideas amongst people who some of them wanted to go with the idea and some of them didn't. So it varied. There's a lot of research that still could be done. And if I were writing a book on this topic, I would be doing um, further research about it. It fascinates me, um, and maybe it would be interesting to someone else. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Maybe. And we should kind of reach out to them to see if some of them would like to explore. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it um, yeah. while we're here in, you know, in the next three days. In the hallway. Yeah, hallway chat. I'd like that. Well, I want to say thank you very much for joining me, and I'm going to give you, you know, 12 minutes to go take a break before the next session. Thank you.